Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Fernando Benuni Silvones. I'm the Executive Vice President of Juan Sotheby's, and I have the pleasure to be hosting as a moderator this panel, where um, we have Alicia Cervera La Madrid. She's the managing partner of Cervera Real Estate. Um, Cervera has done a tremendous um, job for our community, representing a significant amount of projects for many, many years. And um, I have the privilege to share many panels with Alicia, and I consider her a very good friend. So. Alicia, thank you for joining us today and welcome. Pleasure to be here. Hi, Fernando. Hi, how are you? So Hi. we have um, Dr. Michael Cheng, Dean of the FIU Chaplin School of Hospitality and Tourism Management. Um, Michael, thank you so much for joining us today. We have, uh, we really would like to hear your uh, point of view about this, I mean, of this pandemic, what is your view on, on, on this industry? So welcome, Michael. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here too. And, Kevin, uh, welcome to the panel. Kevin Ruiz is a senior manager of business development at the Miami DDA Authority. Um, this downtown, uh, downtown, this house is the downtown district authority. And uh, thank you so much for joining. Uh, we have the pleasure to do several um, panels with you guys when we had uh, Rico City Center. And so we had a lot of history in common and we're very excited to learn all the new companies and what's your view on the development of downtown. So Kevin, very welcome to the panel. Thank you for having me. So today, this panel is going to be focused on the rise of downtown Miami. Downtown Miami was until recently one of the most underdeveloped areas in Southeast Florida. If we consider what happened in Brickell, what happened happen in Edgewater, we see that there's still significant number of development sites that were still available in the downtown area. The announcement of the Miami World Center, um, pretty much like 80 years back, it was a massive mixed-use development has generated a domino effect for developers to tap into the downtown market. Due to the, to the important positive externality this project will have in all the different sites, I feel that that's also created a very important critical mass for the expansion of hospitality, food and beverage and re retail industries. Uh, the Bright Line has also had a tremendous impact in downtown value proposition to do the improved connectivity with other cities, including Aventura, Fort Lauderdale, Boca Raton, West Palm Beach, and Orlando in the future. So um, downtown also enjoys uh, a tremendous uh, connectivity thanks to the access to the Metro Rail, the proximity to the Port of Miami, and the easy access to the Miami Airport. So this central location um, and the proximity with other neighborhoods like Brick College, Water, Wynwood, Design District, and even Miami Beach, has fostered a revival of the area. So today we wanna to focus about what downtown has to offer. And we would like, I would like to start this panel by asking um, a general question to our panelists today. That is downtown as a neighborhood is emerging as a new epicenter of the city and continues to e evolve rapidly. So this renaissance is like no other city in the country uh, since the population has doubled in the last 10 years. So in your opinion, has the downtown area changed? How much has changed? And what's your vision for the next five years? Well, I think it's undoubtable uh, that uh, undeniable that it has changed. It's changed dramatically. And I think that that change has been led by um, honestly phenomenal uh, investment in the infrastructure and in the, in the city itself. And by the city itself, I mean the, the construction of the museums the museum park and that many of the uh, key projects that you mentioned, like Brightline, et cetera, or the Virgin, as it is called now. So I think that um, while we had developers with great vision, like related, that came in and we were uh, fortunate enough at Cervera to sell the first residential uh, building that had been built in downtown. But, and we kept asking, how long has it been? And nobody could remember. And um, I remember when we started talking about downtown as a neighborhood, people thought we were nuts. And, and here we are. It is a thriving neighborhood, but I, I think it's a... a in many ways, it is what it should be, which is the heart and soul of our city um, and our county, because it is the entertainment heart and soul of the city and account with billions of dollars. And of course, an education center, as uh, Dr. Chang will speak to as well, not only with, with um, the, the college, but so many other uh, uh, colleges and universities and education opportunities there. Thank you, Alicia. Um, I would like to now to ask, um, I think it's Kevin. Um, as I'm done, continues to see new developments, restaurant, retail companies are also setting the rise in Miami downtown as a, as a major city to bring their companies 
and to relocate um, their headquarters or even to open a satellite office. Especially, we know that we have 1,200 uh, pretty much headquarters that are covering Latin America from Miami. We're seeing companies from Europe that target in Miami to the, their expansion to the, to the Americas. And we have Latin American companies that have set their base here in Miami to enter the United States markets. Uh, we're very curious, and I know that um, a lot of your work is confidential, but we would like to, for you to go into a little more detail what major businesses are moving to Miami, what industries and what sectors in particular have you seen that are growing the most? Um, and if you can drop some names, or that would be ideal, but uh, we, could, we don't count on that. So Kevin, please give us some light here. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, what, what we're really seeing is an increase in domestic movement. Um, you know, I think tax reasons, uh, you saw the, the SALT laws going into effect in 2017 and 18. Um, just to give you a quick overview for those who might not know, you know, our corporate tax rate is essentially four and a half percent. You look at Illinois, nine and a half percent, Massachusetts, eight percent, Connecticut, seven and a half percent, and New York, six and a half percent. And then from the income tax, everyone knows we have zero percent income tax. Compare that to the same states, Illinois is 4.9. 4.95%, Massachusetts 5%, Connecticut 7%, and New York 8.82%. So just for tax reasons alone, um, we're seeing an influx. But what you're seeing increasingly um, are the two sectors that we continue to, to, to focus on are the finance industry and the technology industry. Finance seems to stem mostly from those tax reasons, but from the technology side, uh, it's more so of the quality of life. Um, so kind of going back to your first question, a selling point for us, as you touched on, is our transportation. Uh, traffic is terrible in every city, no matter what city you're in. I know we like to think we're the worst, but I'm telling you we're not. Uh, but what you're seeing is our urban core has something that no other of the other 33 municipalities have in Dade County um, or anything in Broward or, or Palm Beach for that matter. So we have Brightline, which runs north-south. That's kind of our, our speed train. Tri-Rail, which is our commuter uh, train, you know, the Miami DDA uh, spearheaded the expansion of that. Uh, we contributed 1.2 million and we expect that to open up in the first half of next year. We have the Metro Rail, which goes north-south, the Metro Mover and the Miami Trolley, which operate within downtown. Um, so for, for people uh, from a town perspective, uh, the younger generation tends to not like to drive. Um, and then you have people coming from the northeast um, that don't really, uh, haven't really driven and, and don't prefer to begin driving. Um, so you're seeing an influx there as well. We also have arts and culture uh, with the Art Center, um, NBC Museum of Art and Design, which opened up in 2012, PAM in 2017, Frost in 2017. We also have a myriad of events uh, like the Miami Film Festival, Miami Book Fair, the Herald Hunt, um, History Miami, all these things which the DDA provides grants to. Um, so, so you're really seeing those two, uh, those two industries flock to the quality of life, but especially in technology. Um, I can give you a, a few numbers. Um, can't really tell you who we're talking to, but I can tell you uh, some companies that are here. Um, in particular, on the technology side, we have Kaseya, uh, Insight Tech, and Reef. All three of those are what's deemed a, a unicorn, which has a valuation of over a billion dollars. Um, and all three are headquartered within the DDA. Um, so you're really seeing to, to, to see that side of it take off. The finance side is more established, but on the technology side, it's, it's growing, and I suspect that to be the industry that grows fastest within the next five years. I totally agree with you. And as a matter of fact, financing technology, the main input is the internet speed. And the fact that the NAP of Americas is located in downtown Miami has a huge impact because, for instance, in the, in the hedge fund industries, et cetera, this look, our algorithm in terms of the trade, one millisecond can represent an important percentage over the index over, over a one year period. So. Um, yeah, we're very excited. I used to be an investment banker for 10 years and I've been on the trading floor, so I know how important it is to have the equipment working for you. So, uh, Kevin, thank you so much for the insight. So, um, I would like now to jump um, to Dean Chang. Um, and you know that with all this, um, in a way, uh, pandemic, uh, I just would like for you to give us some more insight in terms of what you expect um, from the hospitality um, the, um, and the restaurant industries, how do you see that impacting uh, our business and uh, how do you think that is, how long do you think it will impact? So what do you think that 
I know in the short term how, how it does, but how do you think that we, how is going to play out in the long term? Thank you, Fernando. I think <clears throat> this uh, pandemic has been um, not very kind to the hospitality industry, you know, to, to say it <laughs> kindly. Uh, it's really been pretty brutal to the restaurant industry. Um, you know, the restaurant industry itself is just, we operate on such a thin margin, you know, like single digit margin. So when you when you close down dining rooms, it just makes it really hard. And then when people started working from home and working remotely, um, now downtown in a concentrated area like this, you lose a lot of customers. You know, so you've even lost the opportunity to really s supplement some of your income with uh, carryouts and deliveries. Um, the, the loss of revenue from dining rooms, though, I mean, the estimates are just crazy. It's like 80 to 90% drop overnight when they close. I just heard this weekend, uh, Zest and Otanic, they closed. I mean, that was like tragedy, you know. And But some restaurateurs, <clears throat> they have managed to pivot their business model. Uh, Mignonette downtown, they, they transformed into an Italian pop-up which was a very smart move on Danny's uh, part. You know, and they know the limitations of the menu and what people want to eat. And I mean, nobody really wants to eat raw oysters uh, or want it to be delivered, <clears throat> but freshly made pasta, those kind of comfort food, uh, meatballs, the, the kind of stuff people want that stuff. So a lot of them, they're really doing the best they can to, to stay open and, and to come back. But I think honestly, it's gonna be hard uh, without indoor dining. And then with the limited outdoor seating that they have downtown, uh, in the narrow one-way streets, it's just going to be a challenge. Um, and then to reopen too, to follow the guidelines of uh, the city, you know, the cost of PPE for these restaurants, these are additional expenses that were not budgeted for. You get, and it ranges anywhere from 3000 to 30000 just to get it ready because you, you want your your customers to feel safe. You know, and you want your staff to employees to feel safe too coming in. So this stuff all costs money, face masks, you know, hand sanitizers, disposable menus. And like you said earlier, <clears throat> if there's anything, uh, that there's a silver lining really, I think the, the acceleration of the adoption of technology has, has been a game changer. Um, QR codes, you know, for payments and for, me and, uh, for ordering, they've been widely adopted in China uh, for the last couple of years. And, and now we're seeing it here because we, we need to have contactless uh, payment. Uh, the other thing that I noticed uh, just going from my travels, uh, my business travels to China was uh, the food delivery delivery on electric scooters. You know, all over China, uh, you got food deliveries from all kinds of restaurants on electric scooters. I see maybe that's the next big wave that will come here. And, and as uh, Kevin mentioned just now, uh, Reef, I'm very excited about these guys. Uh, the Reef technology, they're doing a bunch of ghost kitchens. And right now they have Mike Genuine, I believe, um, Mike, Michelle Bernstein and Della Bowles, and they're expanding the footprint. So maybe the restaurants uh, in the foreseeable future could exist in a virtual space with the dining experience could adapt to one where you can have like a three course meal made by your favorite restaurant and delivered to your home in less than 30 minutes. You know, like currently the Miami Spice to go promotion. And I think the future is here, you know, and we're all furiously adapting to it. Thank you, Bing Cheng. Uh, that's very good insight about um, the industry. Um, Alicia, I, I just would like to ask you a little bit more about Nativo. That is one of our main sponsors today. Um, up yeah. until now, Nativo will have 448 residents and about 156 hotel licensed homes. So why do you think that um, the development team has chosen uh, downtown for the location of this innovative project in Miami? And what do you think that the, what are the main attractions of, of the area that you feel that will make this project as successful from the hospitality point of view? Well, you know, we all, we always or often say that Miami is the capital of Latin America. I think in many ways it's turned into the capital of the, of the world, <laughs> at least our part of the world, if you will. Um, and the, the choice of downtown Miami for, for Nativa, which is such a progressive project, uh, was in many ways kind of an obvious one because it is at the epicenter of all of this fantastic activity. It was a little terrifying uh, to hear the Dean speak about, you know, virtual dining experiences because um, the the whole concept of going to, to a beautiful restaurant and it's, it's, it's so much more than just the food. And of course, downtown Miami had become the epicenter for, for the finest dining in our city and on many, many levels. But it's also, 
um, the center for business. And as you were talking about the NAP, it also gives us redundancy in the electrical grid, which is a wonderful thing. It's right um, um, on the bay with easy access to, as I like to say, the world, because it's right by the, the connectivity to the airport. You can drive to the airport or you can take uh, the, the mass transit to the airport. And of course, it's right on the intersection on your way to the, to the port. And um, the port is, in fact, the, the cruise industry is the, the number one driver for uh, restaurants days and for a, a, a huge driver for a lot of the tourism in town because they usually either add a night at the beginning or at the end or both. So to have this kind of flexible living where people can live there all year long if they want to or, live, uh, or lease it out on a short-term basis on a daily basis, you wanna be in an area that A is a great neighborhood because the concept of Nativo is to live it like a native, which of course is what everybody's looking for when they go to a city to, to not feel like you're, you know, in the middle of nowhere or in some cookie cutter concept, but rather to be able to experience the unique lifestyle of the place that you're going to visit or the place that you're going to work with the convenience of being close to whatever it is you want to do while you're there, whether it's go to a business meeting or go to a museum or go to a basketball game or go on your cruise. And Nativo is in the perfect location right in the heart of that. And as I like to identify it on top of that, you get to describe your address as behind an icon in the world, which is the Freedom Tower. So it's it's really a, a beautiful combination. And the the um, developers have put together a very comprehensive um, architecture and combination of, of uh, opportunities there from great ground level dining experience to, as, as you know, Fernando, because uh, HQ is handling it, wonderful um, offices that you can have your office there, you can own your office there. And then they have the Nativo Social, which is over 70,000 square feet of amenity space being designed um, even more now, although the concept was, I would say, very forward thinking and ahead of its time because it was already designed with a lot of indoor outdoor space. So you have a, a workspace, the, the work where you have co-working spaces so you don't have to get in a car and commute, but you also don't have to work from your house with a book stand behind you like I am now, <laughs> but rather have a very professional environment where you can work. They have an auditorium where you can have your audiovisual presentations. Um, they have meeting rooms where you can uh, brainstorm with other people with a, either a lounge environment or shared desk. So it gives you a, a full opportunity to have a phenomenal office without additional rent space, you know, rent because it's right there, part of your building with zero commute. And I think very much in the way that we're going. You also have the splash, which is that fantastic area with a phenomenal pool with an island in the middle. And then it has all of those amenities when you want to relax, you know, there's a great bar, you can hang out there. If you want to hide, there's a speakeasy. And 95% uh, of that space can be open air because even the indoor spaces with the nano walls that open completely up will let you be indoor outdoor and have access to that free fresh flowing air, which we always loved. And now we know not only do we love it, but we need it because it's become a, an important part of keeping us healthy. So they've got great designs in what are very practical functional spaces that, as I said, the idea is that it doesn't feel like a hotel room. It's not a hotel room. These units all have balconies. They're actual homes. They're very livable. Um, and they're created for inner city, for downtown, for major city living. So they're much more efficient spaces that are very affordable. As you know, our prices start in the mid 300s. So it's a very easy access point to come in with terrific uh, design and really thought through product. You know, Alicia, I wanna say the whole concept of community uh, engaged and living together and working together, people want that. You know, even though today we cannot have it, but ultimately people want that. That's why we yes. go out to eat. You know, that's why we eat in restaurants. We have a grand, great time. Um, but what Reef Technology is doing with their ghost kitchens is, to, is giving you the freedom to get the food from wherever you want and then right. to all dine together. So you know, when this all clears up, like having like a great community dining room space within our table, we got to do that. <laughs> yeah. We're, we're also great right next to the university, which is a wonderful thing. <laughs> so exactly. it's another great option. Yeah. So Alicia, um, first of all, congratulations. Um, uh, despite uh, all this um, pandemic, you, you, you were doing the, con the contract conversion in the middle of all this mess. And right. you guys have done a tremendous job on selling. So how, how, how many units have been sold and um, how has been the sales been affected? And what tools have you been using to promote the project after this new reality? 
So the project is about 50% sold and you're quite right. We were in the conversions in the pandemic and uh, very grateful to, to the developers for coming up with such a grateful product, which is a great product. And um, to our buyers for showing the commitment, you know, people are smart. And when they see a good product in a good location with a good value, they hang in there. And so we actually finished converting the, the last couple of buyers, Fernando, like 10 days ago. So right. it took a little bit of convincing for those last holdouts holdouts, but they didn't want their money back. They just said, we need a little more time. We need a little more time. So finally uh, we got them across the finish line. And um, honestly, when the shutdown came, the first month was tough because as you said, we had the technology. And in fact, we had been doing virtual presentations for a long time, but to get the buy-in from the customers was a little more difficult because they, you know, they were even okay coming to presentations and we were very fortunate to have our team fully trained and, and all of that was organized in our company. We've been doing webinars and Zoom presentations and all of that stuff for a long time. And our customers were kind of used to getting those invitations, even though maybe they weren't attending clearly as much as they did when we went into the shutdown. But that idea of transacting at the beginning was more challenging. So um, when, when things you know, settled into, hey, this is the way it's gonna be for a while. And, and especially in a lot of our feeder markets uh, down South, they were really locked down. You know, we had more freedom of movement, but these guys were really shut down. So then we did start transacting. We had movement. Um, I can't tell you we were selling, you know, we were selling the, the same 20 units a month that we were clipping along uh, month in and month out and sometimes more than that. But we have had steady interest and it continues to be attracting buyers that, that, uh, that people I think got a little confused. Are we coming back? Are we not coming back? We're open, we're shut, you know, so there's been some confusion in the marketplace. I think it's getting easier every day as more and more people, um, as we were talking earlier, get used to, and there's more buy-in from our consumers to, to go ahead and, and people are more used to electronic signatures and getting the contracts done and getting the virtual presentations and all of those things. So we continue to forge ahead um, and uh, the product is extremely well received. So people love it. 100%. We're, we're feeling the same thing with Creative HQ. Um, we had a very good reception for the office spaces. Um, and But what you just mentioned something was very interesting. Uh, the fact that Latin America was totally shut down, in a way, they gave us opportunity for these people to attend some of these virtual seminars that we have been putting together. And they, because one of the things that we have been measuring with our Google Analytics is that how the percentage of desktops uh, have increased during the pandemic in comparison with the mobile devices. And now that in Latin America that continued to be so, but in the United States in the last 30 days, we're seeing the mobile devices start going up again because of the reopening and desktops coming down back again. So it's very interesting to see the dynamics that we're seeing in the Google Analytics is how we need to readapt our marketing strategies. And also, I don't know if you, you, you feel the same way, but this way that we're having the selling, now we need to be more creative. The people when you say, hey, I'm going to do just a presentation for a project, the, the people are just getting a little bit tired of that. So we need to bring more education, more uh, panels like this one that is not focused on a project, it's more focused about an area, about a theme behind it. And I feel that's the way this is going to continue. What do you think? Yeah, uh, no, absolutely. Look, at the end of the day, um, no one is buying a building, a project, a unit. They're buying into a location, into a lifestyle, into an opportunity. And so all of that has to come into it. I think, you know, you and I have been on many panels uh, in real life. You know? <laughs> and I think we've always brought that in. So this is just a, gives us an opportunity to be more diversified in the offering because virtually you can bring in anybody from anywhere. And, and that's, uh, that's been very exciting. So um, I, I think that, that we will continue to go down this direction and it's just going to be another avenue that we're going to continue to use more and more effectively to sell. And I, I think that it's a, it's a spectacular combination to be able to continue doing this and at the same time, pick up again where we left off um, doing some of the travel we were doing. And as you said earlier, travel may not be as intense. I'm a big believer in human contact. I think that, that um, it's a good thing. I think it's something that we all need and want. And I, I think for, for the, the brave and the bold, they'll get on a plane, they'll travel, and it will supplement all of the technology and all of the things that we're doing remotely. And that will come out of this bigger and stronger. And I ultimately believe that Miami's a big winner. I know that it's a difficult thing to say these days because these particular weeks are very, very difficult. But even with that, um, the interest, as, as 
as I guess we're all experiencing in the city continues to be extremely high. And I don't see that going away. I think people that were thinking about going to, to make a move to Miami and to Southeast Florida in general have stopped thinking about it and have said, hey, we might as well do it now because our lives are on hold anyway, so let's just go. 100%, we're seeing a huge uptick in um, seasonal rentals um, in the summer that is not so common for us. Um, and that has been very interesting as well. So Kevin, um, you guys have done a tremendous job in promoting um, Miami and attracting companies to move down here. Um, how do you see all of this um, pandemic and how would you, this new flexible work style and how do you think the business are going to adapt and how is the impact of office market um, in, in for, for the next couple of years? What, what, do you, what do you think? And what, do you, what are the companies telling you what they want to do, where, what, why they want to relocate, size of the office that they're looking for? Give us um, some, some ideas in terms of what, what, what can we expect? Absolutely. So uh, COVID-19 has definitely put things on pause, but I, I don't think that's the case. I don't think it's uh, something that's unique uh, to the city of Miami. I think that's the case everywhere. Um, but I do want to stress the key word here is pause. Uh, out of all the companies we're talking to, no one has scratched Miami off the list because of COVID-19. Um, and then to give you a little background, we actually recently uh, conducted a study based on the business tax receipts within the city of Miami. And we have roughly 35,000 businesses. And according to the Beacon Council, there's roughly 90,000 within Miami-Dade. So what that tells us is basically over one third of all the businesses in Miami-Dade are in one city. And that's incredible because there's 34 cities in Dade County and there's also unincorporated Dade. So to give you a sense of like scope and impact, it's clear that the success of Dade County and the success of the city of Miami is based on our urban core. So um, people are still coming here. Um, Depending on the company, I would say most, if not all, are still saying they're, they're not going remote. And the reason why is, as Alicia alluded to, um, you know, there are a few companies where that might work, but for the vast majority of people, um, they want to be in an office at least part-time. Maybe they have a staggered schedule as this thing goes on. Um, but it, it really hasn't diminished uh, at all in terms of, of people wanting physical space. Um, and the other thing that's important to notice is, is what type of business it is. Uh, going back to that, that proximity factor, if your company focuses on a business to business product, product or service, it's very hard to do that remotely. Um, you need to be near where those businesses operate and that's our urban core. Um, and there's also industry clusters. So if you're a technology company, you wanna be near other technology companies. If you're a finance company, you wanna be near other finance companies. I'm um, just like a few stats that I can show you, uh, share with you about uh, the finance industry um, that we conducted a, a study uh, a couple years back. But it, in Miami-Dade, we had a 52% growth in registered investment advisors. So everything and above family office, essentially a hedge fund or wealth management fund um, between 2014 and 2018. And that's the largest in the state and almost two times the growth rate of the rest of Florida. And, and why is that important? The average salary uh, for someone within the finance sector in Miami-Dade is $130,000. These are high quality, high growth jobs, um, and they wanna be around each other. We have the second largest concentration of international banks outside of Manhattan, uh, and more than 62% of the registered investment advisors in Miami-Dade are within the city of Miami, and 60% of those are within Brickell Ave. So you just walk down Brickell Ave, left to right, you're gonna find one in every single building. 100%. So uh, the Downtown Development Authority um, produced an amazing report that I always download uh, to learn more about the market. So can you tell our audience how to get the reports that you guys do? Because it's a couple, but I love the one on the residential that it makes our life so much easier for us to, to let people know what's going on in the city. No, absolutely. Uh, so if you go to the MiamiDDA.com, uh, we have a bevy of research uh, and data reports. And then if you guys have any specific questions, you can always email us. Uh, we're, we're accessible. We serve the business community and the residential community. Uh, but we try to publish a few reports a year that kind of give a snapshot and an overview as what's going on in the market, uh, both from a residential and a commercial perspective. No, thank you for everything that you're doing because uh, companies like uh, Cervera, ourselves, at one side of this, uh, we, this is um, some of the raw data that we use to, to procure sales. So thank you so much for all this. So tell me a little bit about the, the, the bridge project. Um, so what's the status, um, ETA? Yeah, so you're talking about the I-395 I, I bridge? Correct. Yeah, so that's, that's supposed to be completed either in 2023 or 2024. 
Uh, underneath, there is a park called the Under Deck that is supposed to be in development, which will add a lot of green space to the downtown area. I do want to point out that that's actually a reason why a lot of people cho chose us as well. I touched on um, the arts and culture and things like that, but we actually have two very large parks on Biscayne Bay in Maurice Ferrer Park, and um, that's almost 25 acres, and we also have Bayfront, that's almost 25 acres. So to give you a point of comparison, um, Millennium Park, uh, which is in Chicago, is roughly 25 acres. So we have two of those at inner city center. So you add on the under deck, you add on the underline, which is a 10 mile linear park with the first phase is, that's supposed to be completed October 1st of this year. Uh, we have a lot of green space and that's really, really important for people that do live in that urban environment. Um, so yeah, that, that project is supposed to be completed in 2023, 2024. Uh, and it will be a, our version of the Brooklyn Bridge or, or Golden Gate Bridge in San Francisco. Yeah. Well, well, and don't cool. forget the Bay Walk also, because there's oh, a yeah, lot being right. done to, to access the waterfront, which yes. um, it's, it's such a, a gift that our waterfront, you know, I talked about the airport giving us access to the world where, where the Bay gives us access to the world as well. So it's two unique uh, points of passage, if you will. And the, that activation of the river walk and the waterfront and the Bay Walk is really quite something. Everybody's going to move to Miami you now. There you go. <laughs> we got everything. <laughs> Absolutely. And so, so the Baywalk, is, it's a five mile linear park uh, that goes from the southern end of Brickell all the way up through Edgewater. And the DDA actually helped install 46 new colored LED lights um, in Bayfront Park and along Parcel B. And we also installed 19 additional uh, lights along the FEC, FEC slip uh, near the arena and near the Nintivo project. Our ultimate goal is over the next few years to put those lights all along the, the five mile uh, Baywalk area. Um, and it really will provide a really unique perspective both from the buildings and from the Bay itself if you're on a cruise ship or you're on a, a personal vessel. Yeah, or when you're flying in also, it's gonna really or when you're outline flying in, yeah. the downtown beautifully. So it's quite special. Kevin, uh, and what about uh, Skyrise Miami? I mean, what's the status on, on, on that project? Uh, I don't want to speak out of turn, uh, so I know that COVID has kind of slowed things a little bit, um, but um, it's still projected to go forward, but I, I don't know the timeline as of yet. But I'm, meanwhile, we can, I'll, I'll invite you guys for a ride on the Ferris wheel. Yes. <laughs> that, that's up and ready to roll, right? When can we take a ride on that, do you think? Uh, hopefully soon. I think it's based off the, uh, the occupancy restrictions and everything going on, but yes, it is there. You can physically see it. Yeah, it's um, very cool. So hopefully soon. So um, I, that is our own version of the London Eye. Um, I'm yeah. just looking forward to it. So um, Dr. Dr. Cheng, uh, in addition to the residents, as you know, Nativo Miami offers a hotel component that allows residents owners the opportunity to lease their units and home sharing platforms. So what do you think that the hotel and the short-term rental units are evolving uh, to meet these new COVID standards and pandemic, but in general terms about the zoning and how do you think, think the evolution of short-term rental uh, marketing in Miami Dade? I think it's about experiences. You know, people choose short-term rentals uh, and home rentals and home stays for the experience. Because when you come here, it, it goes back to what Alicia was talking about Nativo. You want to feel like a native. So you want to go to where the natives are eating, to where the nat natives are visiting, where they hang out. Um, and, and when you stay in a home, a short-term rental like that, the host will help you. So I think there's a lot of potential there. I know the hotel industry, um, even though they made a lot of noise about it initially, they're also adapting the business model <laughs> in that direction. So it, it's become more and more accepted. Yeah. It's also, I think, that the convenience thing that, you know, bu buying a Nativo, your unit is not only fully finished, but it's also <coughs> fully furnished. So the, 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 I think the hesitation with short-term rentals and um, all of these platforms that offer it is that people didn't always know what they got. You know, here, it's kind of the combination of home ownership and the hospitality industry. It's, a, it's kind of a perfect meeting of the minds. And at Nativa, where we have the hotel component and you have the residence component, you really are combining the two beautifully. So you have a quality control factor and you have the entertainment factor and you have the native factor so that you get that local feel because it is being designed to the, to the local standards. 100%. And by the way, um, I, Urban Robert have done a tremendous job. The interior design component of the, all the amenities um, is beautiful. And the furniture package is one of the nicest I've seen. It's very different than the standard things that we have seen in Miami. It's not so beach. It's not so contemporary. It's right. a 
different feel. I really, really like uh, and brings the proximity with Freedom Tower and it brings some nostalgic as aspect to it. So I really, really love it. It's a very nice design. Yeah, so, I think that Arquitectonica and um, Bernardo and Ray have done a wonderful job pulling in those architectural features and have given real authenticity to the site that is in fact historical in the birth of our city. So it's, uh, it's, it's a beautiful project really. Yeah, since we're talking about um, this part of the, of the project, Nativo Social is very unique. It provides 70,000 square feet of amenities to the hotel, the residence, and the creative HQ offices. So this is going to be the first social club like the Soho, so Soho House, et cetera. So what do you think was the thinking process to bring something like this to downtown? And what's the impact for, for the building, Alicia? Look, I think the impact's enormous because if, if uh, Soho House showed us one thing when they came to Miami Beach, is that we are in need of more private clubs in Miami where people can come and interact and have that sense of community with a diversified offering. And we really have nothing like that in downtown Miami. Most major cities have uh, these social experiences where people can come in, they can meet with you know, uh, like-minded and different-minded people to be creative and comfortable spaces that offer a full offering. So uh, as I think I said earlier, those 70,000 square feet really provide a very, very comprehensive thing where you have the, the work, where you can do the work and the splash, where you can swim and, and have all kinds of fun like that and the fit where you can go and be healthy. So you've got restaurants, you've got bars, you have entertainment venues, you've got business venues, you've got uh, swim and tan venues, you've got indoor and outdoor work facilities so that you can cross train outside in the open air. You have a hammam. It's been so carefully thought out as to have a, a holistic experience with great options that I think it's, um, it's an exceptional opportunity for the people that are going to live and, and stay there. It's, it's quite something. A hundred percent. And by the way, Creative HQ, um, that is the office component, it's going to be located in the first five stories, of, uh, first stories of the building. And what I love about this project, they give you the flexibility of owning smaller offices from 500 to the entire floor, uh, 500 square feet to the entire floor. So uh, it's very, uh, the unit mix is super attractive. And the location, the proximity of the Brian and the Metro Rail, the, the Port of Miami is something so unique for offices. Uh, and also I feel that um, the fact that this was created previous to the pandemic and it was already thinking about these terraces in the office this creative component that gives you the flexibility to use the diff total different layouts. I feel that it's something unique. So Creative HQ has pretty much 137 um, a, units um, in the office side and it's starting low 300s. Uh, and it's an amazing project because one thing that is important in the office uh, world is that pretty much 95% of the offices are just for lease. Only 5% they are for sale. And if you see the advantages, the long-term advantage of buying instead of leasing, they are huge from the equity creation, from the tax perspective. So, and I feel that the, the long-term potential of downtown is unparalleled because in the next five years, we're going to see most of the projects being totally finished and the walkability factor, the, the food and beverage offering, the connectivity will be very unique. So Kevin, what do you think about this, this aspect of um, the office, um, the creative offices at uh, Anantivo? No, absolutely. I think given the statistics you just referenced, the, the five to 95% um, ratio, I, I, if someone is, is looking and investing in a Miami very long term, I, I think it makes sense. You buy instead of rent. It's, it's similar to the proposition in, in residential real estate. Um, you know, as I mentioned, you know, companies aren't slowing down. Uh, you have several companies coming here from the Northeast for tax reasons or for quality of life reasons if you're a tech company. Um, and it's something that's definitely very appealing. I had the pleasure of, of learning about uh, Creative HQ uh, from your colleagues a couple of weeks ago. Um, and it's, it's great. It's a, it's a flexible option uh, in that building. And there are a myriad of reasons to, to do so, both from financial uh, but also because of where you are. Uh, you're located across the street from AAA. So, um, you know, for business purposes, if you want to take a client to, you know, a concert or a basketball game, um, you also have the 400 plus restaurants and bars that are within the Miami DDA. Um, that's something that I, I think it's overseen a lot uh, because there are a lot of sub-markets like Miami Beach or, or Wynwood, which they're known for the restaurants or bars, but 
uh, we have such a density here that, um, you know, those things tend to follow uh, resonance. Uh, so there's, there's a multitude of reasons to do it, uh, but I think it's a great product. It, it also has parking. That's one, one thing that you, you can park if you want or ride if you want, because we're right on a, on a station so that you can jump on the, the Metro Mover and go. But if you choose to park, well, then it's fantastic that you have a parking facility right there and it's a very ample one. So it really is combining and addressing the needs of, of all of the residents as, as we move into this, this new way of living, which we were heading in that direction anyway. It's, it's been altered slightly, but not, not that much in terms of people um, being mobile, wanting to have more flexible options, um, being able to, to monetize their assets. And I think that one of the unique things that this project does is allow us as owners to monetize our assets so that if you're you know, if you're a student at the college and you're going to go away for a spring break or for the summer or whatever, you, you don't have to break a lease or pay more because you're doing a short term lease, but you can just go and monetize that asset and, and it's going to help you carry it and make money for you, perhaps. So it's a wonderful combination of possibilities. And with HQ, you have the same ability and the same flexibility. So it's just a really, really great, unique product. Yeah, and I think people really value the time, you know, so nobody wants to commute for half hour, 45 minutes or an hour. So being able to live, being able to work and play all in the same community, that's goal. You know, people will pay for that. Yeah, true. Very true. So I just like um, our attendees to, if they want to start um, posting questions uh, in the chat uh, so we can go over, uh, but Alicia, so the, the buyers mix, uh, and, 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 and the residents of Nativo. So where they were coming from? Where are you seeing most of the people uh, buying from the moment and where you expect for the future? Because the, the, despite uh, this pandemic, the dollar has appreciated and in a way we have lost affordability with some of the international markets. So what do you think, what do you have you sold so far? Where they were coming from and what do you expect in the future? Well, one of the interesting things is that um, you're absolutely right where Miami has become unaffordable for a lot of our feeder markets. Um, due to the dollar and just due to the success, you know, it's, it's, <laughs> it's brought us that reality that we're still very inexpensive compared to most of the major cities that we're being compared with, but we are not as inexpensive as, as we were compared to our traditional feeder markets. Well, Nativo kind of creates a solution for those people because when you start the pricing at $350,000, many people thought that downtown would be untouchable at that price. So when they found out that, wow, there's still an opportunity where you can come in, you know, uh, at that low price and, you know, you can get a, a three bedroom unit for under a million dollars and a two bedroom unit in the 600s. It's, it's a great opportunity that people thought had disappeared in a AAA location in downtown Miami. So our traditional market continues to buy in. And of course, that pre-construction payment plan that you have when you're buying over time in a pre-construction building without having to have debt service or maintenance or any expenses until they deliver the key is very convenient for a lot of our buyers offshore. Now, I've always said when I get asked that question and they say, who are your buyers? I, I always answer, our buyers reflect our city. And as our city and the population of our city continues to evolve, so does our buyer population. So of course, we're seeing more buyers from, from the, around the United States and, and more buyers from, from Europe as that's increased as well. Less buyers from the Far East, but some still that are coming, many of them who already live in the United States and are just looking to Miami because it's such a great city and people are so excited about it. So that demographic continues to expand and we are seeing more buyers uh, from the Northeast. And I think that trend is gonna continue. And of course, as the building progresses, we're gonna see more and more of that. And from other um, tax burdened states or states that just don't have the quality of life that we have in our city. And that continues to get better and better because again, many cities or some cities have a lot of the things that we offer, but we are also a young city. So we have younger infrastructure. Uh, we're defending against things like sea rise and we, we passed a huge bond, which is gonna address those issues in the city of Miami. What well, part of the goal of the, the Bay Walk and the River Walk is to create a buffer between us and the, and the water table so that we can be more protected from those things. Our transportation is elevated, it's not underground. So not only is it protected from that water, but it's also uh, more open to the air. You're getting in and out of these cars, you're not in a tunnel, everything is open and, and breezy. The, our bridges are newer, our, everything is newer, so it's cheaper to maintain. So we were lucky that we've uh, built the city with, with um, what have been through some very big highs and some very bad lows, 
but through it, uh, the city has been built, it's been funded, and now it's here. And it's ours to enjoy, to make, um, to make better, to grow. And with Virgin Rail coming, we've become, you know, easily, already a tri-county connectivity between Dade, Broward, and Palm Beach County. And soon we're going to go all the way to Orlando, which, um, while it's great for us to get to Mickey Mouse, it's far better for Mickey Mouse to come to us. And we know that that's exactly what's going to be happening with all of these tourists that are going to say, you know, four days in Orlando, hey, let's go check out Miami. And we also know that once they get here, the love affair starts and it never ends. So um, I think it's, we're going to continue to see more and more international buyers and more and more buyers uh, from around the United States. I totally agree. Um, by the way, the people didn't know that, but from the 70 million people that visit Orlando, 90% they are from domestic markets. We all right. have the impression that it's all full of Brazilians, Argentinians, but that's not the reality. 90% is U.S. domestic markets, and you're 100% right. These people, they don't know Miami, and they will give more, the, because everyone that coming from Latin America, they have been to Orlando for, to this almost uh, the big majority, but I bet my life that this 90% of the domestic market had not been to Miami. And I totally agree with you that the love affair will start when they get to know us. Very likely, not only Miami, but also the, um, the Southeast. I feel that the domestic market, we have a tremendous impact in Fort Lauderdale and uh, Boca and Palm Beach as well. Uh, but I feel that Miami will continue to attract um, more of the younger demographics and more new, the Northeast um, main market. So. So, by the way, thank you for touching on uh, the sea, um, the water rice level rising. Uh, Mario Carozzi has sent a question to us, and I would like uh, Ding Cheng and Kevin to give us their perspective about how the city is preventing and preparing for the potential rise of the sea level. Sure. Um, so, the DDA is actually working with the Army Corps of Engineers. Um, they provided a plan. We're providing some feedback still in the preliminary station, uh, stages, uh, but hopefully it can be a mixture of uh, natural um, seawalls, uh, maybe some low-level uh, seawalls as well that kind of protects us from storm surges. Uh, but no, as, as Alicia mentioned, we have $100 million of the Miami Forever Bond that's dedicated to sea level rise. You combine that with federal funds and state funds, uh, and there will be a solution over the next few years. Uh, we are a city that fully recognizes um, that there are changes, but to give you some perspective, um, and it's something I always kind of chuckle at uh, when we get those negative articles from uh, the New York Times, New York Post, uh, lower Manhattan is roughly about seven feet, which is what Miami is. So if we go under, they go under. Uh, so it's something to, to keep in mind is that sea level uh, affects every city, no matter where you are up the East Coast, uh, and we will adapt to it and change to it. And I, and I agree, you know, and, and it's a real thing. You know, we all recognize that um, FIU does have a sea level rise center that's housed on Miami Beach, and they have been working on this together with the city and the federal government uh, for quite a while now. Dean hey, Cheng, um, I just would like you to touch a little bit more on the, I know that you represent FIU, it's a great organization. Uh, your rankings have been improving most of their program. Your alumni is growing. Um, the, your programs are growing, so you've done a great job of representing us and having a very diverse, um, in a way, um, alumni base. Uh, but I would like to, to talk a little more about, like, broad, broader in terms of what Miami has to offer. Uh, in, of course, if I you, but in general terms, what do you think that why we're different? Well, I think from my perspective, you know, based on uh, my discipline in hospitality management, um, most people see Miami as the hub of hospitality, not just for the Americas, but for the world. So we get a lot of interest. Uh, and, and for us, it's a pretty easy sell to our international students when we tell them where we're located. You know, it's at Florida International University right in Miami. And they're like, oh, I want to go there. <laughs> you know, and, and conversely, too, it has the, that image, too, that, um, you know, from movies, you know, Miami being a party city and Miami Beach being a little crazy. So some of my friends, they say, you know, I don't want to send my kids to this crazy place. I go, no, no, look at, think about the options you got down here. You got a cruise line industry. It's an international hub. You got all these restaurants and, and famous chefs from New York coming down to open up in Miami. So it is growing, you know, and the whole food scene has really changed a lot too. So I think um, it's a pretty easy sell, to be honest for us. Uh, I work in a smaller university in the Midwest before I came to Miami. And for us here, the population that we have to reach 
our gateway to Latin America. It was, it makes it pretty easy for us. I shouldn't say easy, but makes it really attractive for students who want to choose Florida, Florida International University. Uh, what percentage of the alumni is um, their foreign nationals? Uh, alumni base, so just for my school and for Japanese School of Hospitality, uh, our current student population, 38% is international. And of the 17,000, so FIU as a whole has over 250,000 alumni international, uh, all over the world. But for the Chaplin School, we have about 17,000 of it. And of that 17,000, I would say at least 40% are international. Uh, we, we have a program in China. <clears throat> so that we get a very healthy mix of students coming from China and from, of course, from Latin America and the Caribbean as well. And, and Fernando, just to, to build off what Dean Chang said, uh, from a talent perspective for businesses, of course, when they move here, they want to be able to fill these positions if they're a growing company. Uh, we have over 300,000 students among the top 15 universities in South Florida. Um, that's good for sixth in the nation. And I think it's pretty incredible, as Alicia said earlier, City of Miami, which is our oldest city, was founded in 1896. So in roughly 125 years, we vaulted all the way up to sixth in the country. And you look at other cities like Boston, where, which had Harvard founded you know, in the early 1600s, I think it was like 1636. Uh, so they had a 300-year head start. So what we've been able to do is pretty darn incredible. Uh, and it's important for businesses to know that when they come down here, not only are they talented individuals, uh, but they're diverse. So one of the things they don't have to worry about is hiring a diverse workforce. Um, we have that in space. Yep. Yeah, and I think the other thing is, and, and thanks to FIU and the other great institutions, is that this growth is exponential. It's not like it's going up you know, equally every year. I, I see the growth, and I'm sure Fernando can attest to this too, in our industry, is just going faster and faster. And when it used to take a neighborhood 10 or 15 years to evolve, now it takes, you know, five or 10. And, and that's just how our population is growing, is how our businesses are growing. And we're also growing in ways, uh, and in great part, thanks to the work that you guys are doing at the DBA, in ways that are clean with high paying jobs and that are good for our city, for our, our citizens and for our environment. So we're being smart about that. And, and the, the, a lot of the challenges that other major cities have, we just don't have. And not only is that a beautiful thing, but it's a great thing for our economy because we don't have to deal with that cleanup and, and switching gears. You know, we're starting from a good place. Yeah, and also our air pollution index is one of the best in the world. We have no manufacturing. We have pretty much a lot of wind. So we have like 20 when in Shanghai, sometimes 500. I've been there yeah. with a headache like crazy, but uh, that's another aspect that is very good. Alicia, I feel that a Nativo um, from, it's a very good option, like a, for wealthy uh, international and domestic uh, buyers to send to buy a property for their kids moving forward. Do you think people is already think because of the, the proximity to FIU, Miami Dade, the connectivity with Metro Rail with UM and the, yeah. the camp. So the potential about the, the opening of um, the graduate program of Babson University in Brickell. So how do you see this playing out for you in terms of your demand? From international, international no, I, I think it's a wonderful option, not only for us, but for the universities, because uh -huh. um, a lot of the universities are very short on housing and some don't have housing at all. So the, the housing solution, um, I remember going to FIU and inquiring about the housing. And if you're a local, forget about it because the foreigners get first dibs on the housing. So um, it's, it's a, it's a win-win all the way around. And I think for, you know, parents or, and or students that are uh, paying for housing anyway, Nativo is the perfect choice because you have the, uh, the opportunity of having a real estate uh, ownership in a city that's growing phenomenally well in the heart of that city in one of the best locations with a huge rental pool. So that ability to, you know, you take off for a long weekend to go visit your parents, your place can get rented. And if you're strategic, you'll take off during our Basel. So it's going to get rented at 4X or 5X. And, and then you can give the money to your parents or have a great time, <laughs> you know, one way or the other. It gives you a lot of options. So it really is a win-win and very uh, smart of our city to embrace it. And of course, it also gives you the permanence of knowing that the zoning is locked in. They can't take your, uh, your ability to rent this on a short-term basis away because it is built into the zoning the building has that and it's guaranteed, you know, um, locked into the zoning rules and regulations. So you don't have to have that nervous feeling of, oh, I'm going to have the neighborhood come in and shut me down because this isn't sure.
So that also, I think, is a, a built-in value that will continue to grow um, in this part of Miami. And we have the extra plus that we are not in um, the um, Miami World Center Special Taxing District. We're just next to it. So we get all of the advantages without any of the disadvantages. So that's another little plus that we have by being there in this very well strategically located building. Since you're talking about that, um, uh, Ying Chang and Kevin, can you give us some feedback what you expect, how to transform and how will be the impact for the convention center um, in, in the hospital industry that for Mr. Chang and for Kevin, when do you think it's going to be ready? For the future, based on what we know today. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's about, um, <laughs> there's a lot of hybridization happening today. Um, a lot of the meeting planners are all looking at how we can use technology to get, to try to recreate some of those experiences that you have from conferences. So I, I, I'm not so sure we have an answer yet. We're still working on it, to be honest. <laughs> Kevin, but, the conclusion center, what's the, what's the status in ETA and, how you, and Alicia, how you expect that to benefit the short-term rental at Nativo? Well, look, I still haven't figured out how to shake somebody's hand, give somebody a hug, or make that human contact through Zoom. I'm working on it, okay? But it's just not happening. Mm -hmm. So um, I know we're going to be meeting again, and it's just going to be another layer of frosting on this wonderful cake that we're building in, in downtown. And quite frankly, again, our city desperately needs a convention center. Because let's face it, boys and girls, where would you rather go to a convention? Here or Amazing. somewhere else? Yeah, <laughs> you know? exactly. So we know we're going to be booked. We know we're going to be full. And it's, um, it's going to serve like everything in Miami has a, a business component more and more, an arts component more and more, and a fun component forever and ever more. So it's going to serve all kinds of purposes from, you know, the... the the ultra uh, music festival, which people love to hate, but I love to love because it brings young people from mm -hmm. all over the world here. And that's how they, they get to know our city and, and those young folks grow up and they, you know, they turn into full fledged entrepreneurs and professionals and, and uh, college students and university students and so on and so forth. So I think it's gonna be a great thing. It's been a long time coming and can't wait to have our first conference there. <laughs> so okay, and, and go ahead. And it's going to support, so right now we have uh, a little over uh, 40 hotels is existing within the DBA. Uh, that number is probably edging closer to 50 with the recent developments going on. Uh, so a convention center will easily, easily uh, support those hotels. Um, and as Alicia mentioned, um, it's going to support big, big events uh, like Ultra or Art Basel. Um, as for a timeline, I think the timeline kind of shifted again due to COVID. Uh, so I don't have a hard number for you, um, but it, it is something we need. Uh, it is something that we will have. It's going to be in a tremendous location right near the Nativo project. It's going to be across the street from AAA and the Art Center um, and PAM and, uh, and Frost. So you're going to have this really, really big hub uh, of where everyone wants to be and the action wants to be, and it's going to be a perfect location for it. Thank you so much, Kevin. So um, it's 5.58. So um, the, the final remarks for the panelists, starting with the lady. Alicia, please go ahead. Would you, what's your final remarks about this amazing Rice downtown panel? So uh, my final remarks are come visit us. Our office is open. So we are there. We're fully staffed and waiting for you. And we're also open virtually now or anytime. So we look forward to seeing you. We look forward to exchanging information on what you're doing, on what we're doing, and um, uh, helping you come and, and buy your place in downtown Miami and share all of the wonderful experiences that it has to offer. Thank you, Alicia. Christy Garcia in our chat um, is asking how to get hold of a sales rep to buy a unit in Nativo. So can someone then respond to Christy in our chat? So call me, 305-588-9001, <laughs> or you can go online and get uh, Nativo. But I, I, I always you know, laugh when I say call me because I'm the crazy person that means it. So go ahead and call me, 305-588-9001. And yes, my phone is attached to the hip because as I say, if you want someone to answer a phone, make sure they're a mother. No offense, Fernando, <laughs> but mothers always answer their phones. And I'm like double trouble because now I'm a mother and a grandmother. 
So my phone is all the time, but seriously, you can call me, you can go online. Of course, we, we, we have our, our um, all of our information is there and we have a beautiful virtual tours and presentations and they are completely available and maybe we can put them on, uh, on the notes afterwards and share them with everybody who's been here. So you have our website and all of our contact information. Thank you, Alicia. Michael? Um, I would say if you haven't been to Miami yet, you know, back to what Alicia said earlier, you need to just come and try it. You know? And it, that's exa exactly what happened to me. I came here for spring break in 2014, and then the next year I moved here. And there you go. <laughs> <laughs> Best back. endorsement ever, right? I, well, I, I, I would throw some ease. I would happen in that trip, but uh, I, that's for a private conversation, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you, Michael. Uh, Kevin? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, I just want to focus, we didn't touch on it, but since I have some time, uh, in the short term, if you are a restaurant owner or you know anyone who's a restaurant owner, uh, please contact us. We have something called the Equipment Lease Program, uh, where if you get a temporary sidewalk cafe permit, uh, we will provide umbrellas and chairs um, and barriers on the street. So you can basically expand your restaurant and kind of counteract those occupancy restrictions or in the case of us, uh, the fact that indoor dining is closed. Long term for big business, I would say, uh, please reach out to us. You should be your first stop. Uh, we help with site selection. We, we do rating scales for people. Uh, we don't ever rate a specific building for obvious reasons, but we can rate things around said building, points of interest, arts and culture, transportation. Uh, we're working with several large companies who basically say, this is what's important to our employees. Can you tell us about it? And through working with us, uh, we're helping them find a home uh, within the city of Miami. So reach out, we're here for you, um, and that's it. Well, thank you so much, Alicia, Michael, Kevin. That was wonderful, Six, 602. So thank you everyone for uh, attending, and we, look, uh, we really hope that this was helpful for all of you. Thank you so much all, to all, and um, I hope to see each other soon, and give us a hug, so we just miss it. See you guys. Thank, thank you. Thank you, Fernando. Thank you, Fernando. Bye, everybody. Bye-bye. Thank you.